Well, today we are in part three of our message series, Best Prayer Ever. If you are just joining us for the first time during this series, what we're doing is we are looking at the prayer that Jesus taught us how to pray when Jesus was asked the question, how exactly do you pray? And what he gave us was the Lord's Prayer. And week by week, we've been going through this prayer. If you haven't been here, the messages you've missed are online, and I think you owe it to yourself to go to our website and check those out because you already believe you can pray. You might as well learn how to do it, you know, because it's kind of a confusing thing for us as people. So we've been looking at what Jesus said about how exactly we are supposed to pray. Now, in the first two weeks, the, the kind of surprising or perhaps frustrating thing, depending on your background, is that when Jesus taught us how to pray, he began basically by blowing up everything that we thought prayer was all about, because we assume that the purpose of prayer is to ask God for stuff, to ask God to move in our direction, to ask God to do stuff on our behalf. But what we've been discovering is that Jesus said, well, there is a place in prayer for you to ask God to move in your direction, but that's not the main point of prayer, and you certainly don't begin there. Instead, what he introduced is a different basis for prayer and a different primary purpose for prayer. In fact, if you missed these, are, we haven't looked at very many verses so far. This is all we've looked at so far in the series. Jesus said, this then is how you should pray. This is the template. This is the format. This is the model of understanding prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father in heaven. In other words, I am not approaching you as if you are my landlord and I am a tenant. I am approaching you as your child. I have the right to approach you just like a child has the right to approach a parent, just as a son has the right to approach a father. Even if his father is the king, the prince can approach the king with any request. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, which means before I get to my concerns, my worries, I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to worship you. I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to enjoy you. I'm going to take a moment and say, before I get to what's bothering me today, God, I want you to know that I know who you are. You are sovereign God who is good. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. In other words, I want to see your interests move forward in this world. I want to see your interests move forward in my heart, and I cannot wait, and I am filled with hope, knowing that someday in the future I will see Jesus, my Redeemer, standing on the earth with my own eyes when his kingdom finally and fully comes, and I am totally excited to see that future reality, and your will be done. In other words, I've got some things that I want you to do. There's some things that I think need to work out in a certain way in my life, but Father, before I even ask them, I just want to wrestle and struggle with this tension of wanting to be okay with your will over my will. That's what Jesus has taught us so far in prayer. You take some time when you begin to pray and you align your heart with the heart of your Father in heaven. That's why last week there was some homework if you were here. And, and if you missed last week, you should really be thankful that you missed last week because the homework, it's already expired. It was a seven-day homework assignment. The homework from last week was don't ask God for anything this week. That, that was your homework. You have to pray, but don't ask God for anything except that your heart would be aligned with his. And I have had, I'll tell you, I've had the best emails and the best stories this week of people have been coming in like they're ripping out their hair. Jason, this is killing me. I'm trying to do the homework, but I want to ask God for so many things. You have no idea. I had the best one Friday night. Uh, their, their daughter was getting married, and they're worried about the weather, the ceremony, and they're like, Jason, you're killing us our daughter's wedding week, and we can't ask for stuff. So that was a lot of fun. You're going to get some, you're going to get some homework at the end of today, by the way. So, so you're not off the hook. Unfortunately, you are here for this homework. But today, we finally get to the part in prayer where Jesus teaches you this is how you ask God for stuff. So that is a part of prayer, and we get to that today. On the surface, however, when Jesus teaches us how to ask for stuff, it's a total... Bummer. I'm just going to warn you up front. When we get to this, it's like, yeah, yeah, right? But however, when we unpack it and discover what Jesus was teaching behind this petition in the Lord's Prayer, we find something that is exceptionally liberating. And again, if you're not a Christian, you are so welcome to be here. We, we love that you are here today, and you are welcome here. But 
just so you know up front, when Jesus said these words, he said these words to people who were already Christians. In other words, they are people who believe that Jesus is the Savior, the Son of God, and the sin forgiver. So if you're not there yet, we totally respect that. However, Jesus is showing us the Christian approach to prayer. So, so you don't, if you're not a Christian, you don't have to do what Jesus said. You're willing to try it, but, but this is the Christian approach to prayer. So finally, he gets to the point in the prayer where we ask God for stuff, and he said, this is how you ask God for stuff. Give us today our daily bread. That's it. Today, give us the bread that we need for today. Very few of us as Americans have ever in our lives sincerely prayed this prayer. Maybe you've been through a stretch or a season where things were tight and you you didn't know how you're going to make rent next month or you didn't even know how you're going to fill up the gas tank. A lot of us have been there for a season of life. That's very real. But very few of us have ever, if, if maybe for a tiny season of our lives, sincerely on our knees prayed, Father, if you do not give me my daily bread today, I'm not going to survive. Give us today our daily bread. Now, here's why we don't sincerely pray this prayer. It's very simple. It's because we're Americans, okay? We are America. We are sea to shining sea. We we are the nation. In fact, if we could do a global reset and leave all the national boundaries where they are, but then kind of repick from the start and you got first pick, guess which country you would pick to be your country? The United States of America. We are rich in natural resources. We are rich in farmland. We're not too far north. We're not too far south. We got Alaska thrown in for a few million extra. Sweet deal. We are the world's leader of just about everything. We are the world's leading exporter of grain. Okay, we we ship out daily bread, of corn, of so many crops. In fact, we have more exports than any other nation in the world except for China. We're number two on the list. We're like the entire European Union and the United States are about neck and neck. So they need a whole continent to catch up with us in the United States of America. We have so much stuff. We have so much food. We have to knock on doors around the planet saying, hey, you guys need some food? We got like too much of it. We're just... So, so in America, we have so much abundance. Now, for those of us who are poor in America, we have systems set up to get you your daily bread. We have welfare, we have unemployment, we have social security, we have charities, we have churches, we have institutions for those of us who are going through those stretches, those hard times in poverty, because I'm not suggesting that poverty is not a problem in America. What I am saying is we have so much abundance, we have both government and nonprofit institutions set up to make sure more or less pretty much everyone can get some daily bread, which means we have basically excluded God from this category because we have so much abundance and so much affluence, we're taking care of it on our own. It does not occur to us hardly to even think about God giving us our daily bread. Now, the good news is, as Americans, I mean, that, this really, eating isn't a problem. For most of us, eating and living indoors is not a challenge. Other parts of the world, that would not be true. If you were born on a mountainside in Tibet in the 8th century, that would not be true. But hey, we, we live in the United States of America, 21st century. We've basically taken care of this problem. The bad news is, however, that being rich as a nation, and specifically for the people in America who are rich people, being rich comes with some side effects. And we're going to talk about this the reality that being rich has side effects. Now, you have already know this is true because you've met some rich people and you thought to yourself, they're kind of weird. Um, and you thought to yourself, were they weird and then they got rich or were they normal and they got rich and then they got weird? You're not quite sure how that works. But anyway, it is true that being rich does come with some interesting side effects. First one is this. Rich people live in denial. Rich people live in denial. Here's what I mean. A tall person will admit that they're tall. A short person admits that they're short. An athletic person admits they like sports. A musical person admits they play an instrument or or like to sing. 
Artsy people admit that they're creative and their car's a mess and their room's a mess and their life's a mess, but they're happy. They're, they're artsy and they're creative and they'll tell you. Introverts will tell you, yeah, I'm kind of an introvert. Extroverts, they can't wait to tell you I'm an extrovert. I love to talk. They'll, 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 they don't mind telling you that. But rich people won't admit that they are rich. Now, it's either because they don't want you to know or it's because they don't think they're rich even though they are rich. Now, what's interesting is the Gallup poll released a survey years ago, and I've referenced this one before, asking Americans, how much money do you need in terms of annual income to be rich? That's kind of an interesting question. How much income do you need a year to be considered rich? So they asked people who make about $30,000, $35,000 a year, how much annual income would you need to say, I am rich? And their answer... $75,000 a year. Uh, Almost all of them is right there clustered. $75,000 a year, we would be so rich. They asked people who made $75,000 a year, how much annual income would you need to be rich? The answer, about $150,000 a year to be rich. They asked people who made six figures, $100,000 a year. How much money does a person, not you, just a random person need? How much income does a person in America need today to be rich? Their answer was almost $200,000. In other words, people think that rich is about twice as much as they make now. And if they could ever get there, they would be rich. But then when they get closer, because most of you make more money today than you did 10 years ago. As we get closer, rich moves. I'm getting closer to being rich, and right when I got close, it moved further away. We think that there's this magical line out there somewhere that when you cross it, you're rich, but the problem is no one thinks they've crossed it. Or here's kind of the bottom line. Nobody's rich, but everybody knows somebody who is. That's kind of how we view rich in America. Are you rich? No, but I know rich people. I've met rich people, and you ask them, are you rich? No, I'm not rich. I know someone who makes twice as much as me, and on and on it goes. But that's the first side effect of being rich. Rich people live in denial. Now, here's what's interesting. Did you know, if you lined up all the people alive on the planet today, if you earn $25,000 a year, Okay, that's $12 an hour, no overtime. If you earn $25,000 a year, you are in the top 10% of wage earners alive on the planet today. And if you earn $35,000 a year, you are among the top 5% of wage earners alive on the planet today. And if you earn $48,000 a year, you are among the top 1% of wage earners alive today, $48,000. You are the 1% that everybody hates. Who knew it was you? Now, here's what's interesting. Now that I've said that, there is no energy in the room right now. I, I was sure someone would say, I'm rich. Woo! I love my church. I woke up today feeling kind of broke. I came to church. I found out I'm rich. I've been rich for years. This is awesome. Go hope. No, no, it's kind of like, no no energy at all. Everyone's a little bit scared. Now, Now, here's why that is. Let me tell you why that is. The reason why that doesn't excite us to find out that we're rich is because you don't feel rich. Although the global statistics indicate you probably, and I don't know your financial situation, you probably are rich in terms of global income, the problem is we don't feel rich, and because we don't feel rich, we don't think we're rich, and that's the first side effect of being rich. Rich people live in denial of the reality that we're rich. Here's the second side effect. Rich people will struggle with contentment. Rich people will struggle to feel content. Now, you are not going to believe what I'm going to tell you next. So you can be there uh, judging whether or not what I say is true because some of you, you're just not going to believe that this is true. When we accumulate possessions, wealth, goods, cars, boats, whatever it is, the accumulation of possessions essentially is an appetite. Now, whenever you have an appetite that you feed, over time, when you feed the appetite, does the appetite 
get bigger or does it get smaller the more you feed it? It gets bigger. So if you've got a sweet tooth and you feed that sweet tooth, you are very temporarily satisfied, but day over day, week over week, year over year, the appetite only grows and grows and grows. The only way to get rid of an appetite is to starve the appetite. Over time, a starved appetite will begin to shrink. So if you say, no sweets, no sugar, I'm cutting out refined sugar, the first week is torture. You're like, you know, anything, water torture, anything. This is worse than that, but if you get through that first week, the appetite starts to shrink. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller. A fed appetite grows, a starved appetite begins to shrink. Our desire to accumulate possessions is an appetite. That's why when you buy something, there's that very temporary satisfaction you get, but pretty soon the thing you bought no longer brings any satisfaction. In fact, before too long, you're taking it to goodwill because you now consider it junk and you feel good. Hey, I took something to goodwill that I consider junk and now I've got more room to feed my appetite and get more stuff. That's what we do when we struggle with contentment. We feed the appetite, but the appetite never goes away. So here's what rich people do because their appetites are out of control. You, you might have seen this again. You probably won't believe it. Rich people do something that's called upgrade. Have you ever heard of upgrade? It's crazy. Here's how it works. You have something that works, and then you buy a new one that's a year newer that also works, and now you've got two. It's called upgrading. See, rich, rich people have so much money that they just upgrade and, and they get the new one. Here's some examples. Rich people will get in their car that starts and works and runs, and they will drive it onto a car lot. And they will hand the dealer their car keys and their title. And not only that, they will give the dealer a big pile of money in exchange for a new set of car keys that basically operates a car that did the exact same thing their last car did. Oh, that's something only rich people will do. Isn't that weird? That's crazy. But rich people apparently will do that sort of thing. In fact, some people are so rich, their car that they just bought it lives in its own house. It has a garage. Now, one out of 20 people on the planet today even own a car. Rich people have two, three cars, maybe even a boat, and they even have a house for their cars to live in. Some people on this planet are homeless today, not rich people. Even their cars have a house to live in. There are some rich people, this one, you might have heard of this one. There are rich people who will walk into their kitchen and they'll, they'll walk in their kitchen, you know, they're, they're, there's a microwave, countertop, stove, oven, refrigerator, and they will rip all of that stuff out of their kitchen, and they will replace it with countertop, stove, microwave, oven, and a refrigerator, even though all, you're laughing because you can't believe it. It's true. It really happens. This is what rich people will do. Rich people will stand inside of their closet, I've been told. <laughs> because rich people have so much money, they can stand in their closet is a room. I mean, in other parts of the world, six people would sleep in that room. And in America, for rich people, that's just a closet. And they look at a bank of clothes on the top rack hanging up and a bank of clothes on the bottom rack hanging up, and, and that in addition to all their nicely folded clothes and all their drawers and dressers, and, and see if you can finish this sentence. They will look at all of their clothes and they will say, I don't have You know some rich people. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've met some of them. I don't have anything to wear. I've been told there are some rich women And they'll have 10, 12, 15 pairs of shoes. Two feet, 15 pairs of shoes. And then they, they don't have the shoes to match in. And they go out and they buy more shoes to wear. I mean, rich people have it so good, their garbage disposals and trash cans eat so much food, it could feed a small village in other parts of the world. But listen, when, when we get rich, when people get rich and they accumulate more stuff, they struggle with contentment. 
And the stuff they got, it makes them happy. Then it doesn't make it happy. They donate it away, make room for more stuff. And the process continues. Now, Solomon, who lived almost 3,000 years ago, explained why this happened. And he had so much insight. Uh, He's the wisest man who ever lived. If you do not believe me, go to your Bible. Open the book of Proverbs. Open the book of Ecclesiastes. Read through them. And even if you're not a church person, even if you're not a Christian, you'll say, wow, that guy is just smart. He is wise. Here's how he explained why this happens. He wrote... Whoever loves money, whoever loves money. Now, you wouldn't say, well, I don't love money. We're seeing each other, but I don't know that we love each other. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Why? Because a love for money creates an appetite, and when you have an appetite, you will never fully and finally satisfy that appetite. You will only keep feeding it, but it will not go away. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. Here's the question. No, no, no elbows, no eyeballs. Look up here. Here's the question. If I were to ask you, do you love money? Most of us would say, well, no. And you can say how, well, you're just smart with money and careful and you like to save or, or what is splurge once in a while. That's not how you figure out whether or not you love money. Solomon tells us here how to find out if you love money. It's right here. Are you satisfied with your income? Are you satisfied? I'm not saying you don't deserve more. I'm not saying you don't earn more. That's not the question. The question is, are you satisfied with your income? And if you're not, Solomon suggests that the reason why you are not satisfied has nothing to do with the amount of your stuff. It has something to do with the condition of your heart. Because in your heart, you have made a love for money a central driving force in your life. And if you love money, you will never, ever accumulate enough to satisfy the hunger. You will constantly be the hamster on the wheel, chasing, 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 never arriving. The line gets further and further and further away, the closer and closer and closer you get to the line. Are you satisfied with your income? That's the tell as to whether or not you love money and whether or not you will ever find contentment because this is not a financial issue. It's a heart issue. It's a love issue. There's a third side effect to wealth. Unfortunately, we keep going. Third side effect is this. Rich people tend to tie their personal identity and security to their wealth. Rich people tend to to, to tie their personal identity. My value as a person and security. Am I going to be okay? Identity, my value as a person, and security. Am I going to be okay? Rich people tend to tie those two critical psychological issues and emotional issues to the amount of our wealth. Again, uh, Solomon in Proverbs 18 says it this way. He, He wrote here, we have Proverbs 18, the wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine, because it's not true, that they imagine, because they're being deceived, they imagine it an unscalable wall. What he's saying is, the more wealth we accumulate, what tends to happen is, our attention and our hope and our confidence is gradually drawn towards the wealth that we've accumulated for our security and identity. And we begin to think, we begin to imagine If I have just a little bit more money, I'm going to be secure. If I can achieve just a little bit more wealth, my identity, my value as a person will be established. Now, here's the question. In your personal financial world, how much money do you need? How much wealth do you need in order that your life is insulated from catastrophe? that your life is insulated from danger, that your life is insulated from all the ups and downs and layoffs and hardships and, and things that could go wrong in our world, how much money do you need to be secure? The answer is more than you have. And that is always the answer to that question. The answer is always more than you have. Have. That's how much money you actually need to be secure. But Solomon said, this is what happens. I've seen this. And by the way, Solomon had more money than all of us will ever accumulate in our entire lifetimes. Remarkably wealthy man. But here's, he said, here's what I've noticed. 
wealthy people tend to imagine that their wealth is their security. And he said, but it's just a figment of their imagination. Now, that's why poor people don't tend to look to money for security. Do you know why? Because poor people realize, I don't have enough money to even imagine that I could possibly be secure from this. So so that's not an issue for me. Solomon said, this is a rich person problem. This is a rich person issue. Poor people don't struggle with this. And by the way, statistics in America bear out this reality. Did you know that in America today, the more money a person earns, the less money they give away. The more money a person earns, the less money in terms of a percentage of their income they give away. Poor people give away a greater percentage of their income in America than wealthy people do. And Solomon tells us why. We begin to put our hope in money. We begin to imagine that money is an unscalable wall. So, since Jesus knew that being rich comes with some very specific side effects, Jesus built into the Lord's Prayer a mechanism that will help us as we pray be aware of the side effects of being rich, watch out for greed in our lives, so that when we come with our requests to God, we will do so with hearts that are aligned from God, trusting in God, and content with whatever our current situation is as we go to God in prayer. And and it's in this petition. He said, give us today our daily bread. Now, what you might not know is that when Jesus said, this is how you should pray, give us today our daily bread, he was quoting something from the Hebrew Scriptures. In fact, he was quoting something from the book of Proverbs. He lifted a prayer that was prayed over, you know, about nine centuries before he lived, and he just slapped that thing right into the middle of the Lord's Prayer when it came to asking God to give us stuff. Here's the prayer in its original context from Proverbs chapter 30. It says, Two things I ask of you, Lord, do not refuse me before I die. So the prayer is saying, oh, hey, God, this is so important to me. I'm going to keep praying until I have no more breath in my lungs. That's how serious I am about you coming through with this prayer. I've got two things I want from you. Here's what they are. Number one, keep falsehood and lies far from me. Here's why he starts there. The second thing he's going to pray for, he realizes he has the remarkable ability to deceive himself. He has the remarkable ability to lie to himself when it comes to possessions and wealth and riches. So first he's saying, God, I want to see things clearly. I do not want to deceive myself when it comes to wealth. I do not want to lie to myself, so keep falsehood and lies far from me. And the second thing is this, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only Give me only, you say it, give me my daily bread. He's saying, God, here's what I want. First of all, I don't want to lie to myself in this category. Second is this, I want daily bread. I don't want poverty. Don't give me poverty. I don't want riches. Don't give me riches. What I want from you, what I want you to give me, and I'm going to pray this until my dying breath. That's how serious I am about this, God. Give me only my daily bread. Now, why would he pray, don't give me those things? Because a lot of us have probably prayed for one of those things. Give me only my daily bread. Here's why. Look at this insight. This is incredible. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? God, if you give me riches, I know that I am foolish enough to say, I'm fine, I'm content, I have got it going on. Look at what I have accumulated with my hands, with my smarts, with my ingenuity, with my cleverness, with my deals, with my abilities. Look what I have put together. I am so self-reliant that I might say, Who is the Lord? I think this is one of the main reasons why in our country today God has been removed from the national conversation. Because we have been so affluent, so wealthy as a nation that our nation collectively has said, Who is the Lord? We, 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 We have got daily bread so covered, we don't need God in our country anymore. So he says, God, the reason why I don't want wealth is because I don't trust myself. 
Because when it comes to your kingdom and being a Christian, I'm a liability, not an asset. So don't give me riches or I might forget you, disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. If I become poor and I don't even have daily bread, I might have to resort to sin in order to survive. And that will dishonor you. And I do not want to dishonor the name of the Lord my God, whom I worship and whom I serve. So God, keep the deceit out of my heart. Don't give me poverty. Don't give me riches. Give me only my daily bread. Now, in this full context of the prayer, the original prayer, we find the second reason why we as Americans don't sincerely pray, give us this day our daily bread. The first reason is because we have so much daily bread, we don't even think we rely on God for it anymore. The second reason is right here. A lot of us are afraid God might answer that prayer. Give me only my daily bread. Oh, okay. That's all you want? You want to be reduced to that level? Oh, no, 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 no. No, I'm just, you know, we just prayed in church. I didn't mean that give me my daily bread. I meant like, you know, and house and boat and cars and all that other stuff too. That's why we don't pray it. We are deceiving ourselves. We are not paying attention to the reality that if we become rich, we run the risk of saying, who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? Now, to help us with that tension, to help us with the tension of sincerely praying, all I need is daily bread, God, and I will be fine. We're going to turn our last verse today. It's in the New Testament book of 1 Timothy. Uh, there the apostle Paul wrote, and, and he's, he had authority, he had moral authority to speak on this because he, he lived penniless. He, he lived relying on daily bread. He spent many years in prison for the sake of the gospel, preaching Jesus. And here's what he wrote about this whole thing. He said, command those who are rich in this present world. So if you're not rich, hey, this does not apply to you. You can tune out for a minute. But just for those of us like rich, you might even be the 1%. Command those who are rich in where in this present world? What's the implication? There's another world. And if you are rich, that's only going to help you in this world. Being rich in this world doesn't necessarily help you in the eternal world. You're rich in this world. Great. Fine. It's a blessing from God. You are rich in the present world. Not to be arrogant, we're like, how did he know? Not to be arrogant, nor, this is key, to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Paul knew what Solomon knew, what Jesus knew. We have a tendency at the center of our souls, at the center of our hearts, to put our hope in wealth. To think that wealth is our unscalable wall, to think if I have wealth, I'll have an identity, I have value. If I have wealth, then I'll have security in this world. But he said, no, 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 wealth is so uncertain. Instead, he says, next verse, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. He says, don't put your hope in wealth. If you're rich, don't put your hope in wealth. If you're poor, don't think that wealth is going to save you. It's just wealth. If you have daily bread or if you're poor, rich, wherever in between, put your hope in God. Now, let me put this in a different context to help you analyze it from a more objective perspective. Imagine that you are lying in a hospital bed and you have all that stuff hooked up to you that you do not want hooked up to you. And the doctors say that there's nothing else we can do. In that moment, where will your hope be? Your hope is going to be in the answer to the question, what happens when I die? Your hope will be in the answer to the question, how am I going to give account of my life to God? Your hope will suddenly, fully, 100% be, as you are peering over the edge into eternity, placed in God. I promise you, you will not at that point have any hope in wealth. None. What Paul is getting at here 
when he says, do not put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put your hope in God is this. Your hope is going to be in God at the end. Why not put your hope in God in the middle? If at the end you're suddenly going to realize there is no reason for me to hope in money, it cannot help me with what I believe is truly my greatest need, worry, and concern, then why would you put your hope in money right now? If you're going to hope in God then, then put your hope in God right now. Don't hope in riches. Hope in God. He richly provides things for you to enjoy. Great. If you have things more than daily bread, wonderful. Enjoy them, but do not put your hope in them. Put your hope in God. And here's why Christians can put their hope in God, regardless of whether or not you are rich or you are poor. You can put your hope in God because at the center of your soul, there is something that you must have above all things. It could be wealth. It could be Jesus. It could be something else. But if anything is at the center of your soul other than Jesus, it will be your master. You will serve it. You will chase it. It will say, sacrifice your life for me to gain me. If if money is at the center of your soul, you will sacrifice your health, you will sacrifice your years, you will sacrifice your family, you will sacrifice your faith in order to pursue that God. Only Jesus, only Jesus said, I will not ask you to sacrifice and give your life to attain me. I will sacrifice and give my life to attain you. See, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich for your sakes, because you were at the center of his heart, he became poor He lived a life, not just a life of poverty, but on the cross he was stripped of everything. He was stripped of his friends. He was stripped of his clothing. He was even stripped of the presence of the Father. He became poor so that you through his poverty, through his sacrifice, through his life, through his death, have become rich, heirs of glory heirs of eternal life. And when you know that Jesus did that for you and he lives at the center of your heart, at the center of your soul, it will cause you to view wealth. It will cause you to view poverty. It will cause you to view riches in a completely different light. Who cares if you have money on earth? It's not your real treasure. You might have money, you might not, but your real treasure is in heaven. Who cares if you have wealth, possessions on earth? Your real possessions, your real treasure, your real hope is untouchable. Your real unscalable wall is in heaven. Christ became poor through you so that you have been made an heir of glory. So don't put your hope in wealth. Put your hope in God. And when we pray, Father, give us today our daily bread, that prayer is to be a struggle in our hearts. A struggle saying, Father, I am trusting in you to provide my daily needs, and if you so radically change my financial reality that all I have is daily bread, I'm going to be okay with that because I still have you. I still have my ultimate identity as a child of God. I still have my ultimate treasure. I still have my ultimate security. Rich, poor, doesn't matter. If I've got daily bread, I'm fine. And that is the thing, the truth, the struggle that will liberate you so that what you have beyond daily bread is a gift from God. Now you can truly enjoy it. Now you can truly receive it with thanksgiving because it doesn't own you. It doesn't control you. Now you've got these blessings that God did give you for your enjoyment, but now that your hope is not in them, but your hope is in Christ, the stuff, it's, you hold it loosely. Now you can use it for God's glory, God's kingdom, the good of others, and really enjoy the riches you've been given. So here's the summary of what we're saying when we pray, give us today our daily bread. Here's the summary. I will not trust in riches, but in God who made me 
rich. I will not trust in riches, but in God who made me rich. When you pray the Lord's Prayer, that's what you're praying. Now, here's your homework for next time. So, another seven-day homework assignment. It expires after seven days. This one is worse than last week's. I just want to warn you up front. Um, Sorry, we're we're another week into the series. This is like advanced course now. We're at week three in the series, all right? Here's your homework. This week, pray only for daily bread. This week, pray only for daily bread. And this is going to kill some of you because you've got the house that will not sell. You've got the application submitted. You've got the deal going on. You've got the car. You've got your eye on. Okay, fine, fine, fine. This week, wrestle this to the ground. Pray only for daily bread. Just pray, God, I will not trust in riches, but in you who have made me rich. Now, this is just like the parts of the Lord's Prayer that go before it. You're going to get to this spot in the Lord's Prayer some days, and you are going to get stuck, and you are going to struggle to pray that sincerely. God is okay with that. Just like some days you are going to struggle to pray, you know, your will be done, and and you're not quite there yet. You can just sit there and wrestle with it. God's like, that's okay. I got time on my hands. We can, we can just stop there for the day and pick it up there tomorrow. When you get to this prayer, give us this day our daily bread. If that in any way makes you go, I'm not sure I want God to only give me my daily bread. You've learned something about your heart. You've learned something about what's at the center of your soul. And you can stay there with God in prayer and just wrestle with that idea. God, I don't want to trust in riches. I want to trust in you who made me rich. God, I know that's where my hope is going to be at the end. Help me put my hope there now. And that's the truth that liberates us from our appetites for stuff and lets us truly begin to enjoy stuff as a blessing from God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. We'll pick it up there next week. Let me pray for you. Jesus, thank you for this incredible, incredible insight you give us into ourselves, into our hearts, into our souls as we read your word this morning. I know it's easy for me to stand up here on a stage and talk about this, but it is so hard for us to go home and to put this into practice. My prayer for everyone listening today is that all of us would have the honesty to pray this to you that you would keep falsehood and lies far from us, but you would give us the honesty to ask, give us our daily bread. And if we struggle with that, and if that terrifies us a little bit, that we would acknowledge that perhaps our hope is not in you, but our hope is in what you have provided for us. Father, cure us of this. Let us more deeply see and love the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ so that we will truly know that our treasure, our real treasure is Him and it is in heaven. So so give us the wisdom to know how to wrestle through this truth and submit to you and give us the courage to do it. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.